So a couple of videos ago, we saw that when we combine this product of cycles, 3, 7, 3, 4, 5, 3, 7, it turns out that the result, 4, 5, 7, is an awful lot like the 3, 4, 5, which we had in the middle here. This is an example of something called a conjugacy of permutations, and it's something I want to talk about in this video extra. Conjugacy is one of the more powerful tools that al algebraists have to study groups, because conjugacy, it turns out, relates together similar elements, elements that act similarly within a group. One motivation for conjugacy can actually come from linear algebra. In linear algebra, you study similarity transformations, and what those are is ways of relating together linear transformations that behave in similar fashions, just perhaps under different bases. Right? When I change a basis in linear algebra, I get a linear transformation that does the same thing, just slightly differently. Right? And so there, we call it similarity. In abstract algebra, we call it conjugacy. And we say that two elements of a group G and H are conjugate if there exists a third element, x, such that one of the elements is equal to the other with an x on one side of it and the inverse of x on the other side of it. We call this operation here G conjugated by the element x. And why conjugacy is super useful and flexible is it turns out that conjugacy is an equivalence relation. Uh, that this relation here, that G is conjugate to H, is symmetric. Uh, if G is conjugate to H, then H is conjugate to G. It's reflexive, every element is conjugate to itself. And it's transitive, if G is conjugate to H, and H is conjugate to J, then G is conjugate to J. And because it's an equivalence relation, the equivalence classes of this relation actually partition a group. And this is why it's so useful to study conjugacy. Because now conjugacy cuts up a finite group into a finite collection of pieces, a partition, where everything belongs to one and only one. And inside of each of those conjugacy classes are all elements that somehow or another behave similarly to each other. So we might ask at this point, uh, what does conjugacy look like in a symmetric group? What does it mean for two things to be conjugate? And as we saw in the, in the video a couple of videos ago, where we did out this product, 3, 7, 3, 4, 5, 3, 7 inverse, and we didn't have the inverse back then, but 3, 7 inverse is the same as 3, 7, because it's a two cycle. That ended up being 4, 5, 7. Let's try and understand what's actually happening here. I'm going to use stack notation to look at what just happened. So 3 and 7 traded places, and then position 3, 4, and 5 did their little three cycle, three step here. This one went forward, this one went forward, this one wrapped back around. And then 3 and 7 traded places again. And so when we look from the beginning to the end, what we notice has happened is that 4, 5, and 7 end up being the things that trade places instead of 3, 4, and 5. So what's happened? Well, 3 and 7 merely were relabeled as each other, right? So 3 put on the 7 mask and then did this step and then took, then they took the masks back off, basically, uh, at the end of the dance. So what we got was still a 3 cycle, just like 3, 4, 5. We just had 7 in place of 3. Because after all, 7, 4, 5 is the same 3 cycle as 4, 5, 7, which is how we denoted this cycle uh, in a couple of videos ago. So when conjugacy acts in the symmetric group, all that happens is that the labels that we use uh, to accomplish this permutation here in the middle, the labels change. 3 put on a 7 mask, and then this happened, and then they took their masks off. right? And so it ends up still being a 3 cycle, just with a 7 in place of a 3. What we can prove is that this is the case for any conjugacy inside of Sn. That in the symmetric group on n symbols, g is conjugate to h if and only if g and h have the same what we call cycle type. It's made up of a product of the same lengths of cycles. So, for example, any two three cycles inside of Sn are conjugate to one another. So, if I think about S4 for a minute, it's got 24 elements in it. I can list them all. You know, so, I start with the identity. I maybe list out all the transpositions. Then I list out all the three cycles. Then I'll list out all of the four cycles. And then once I've listed all the four cycles, I still have three more elements left that are the product of disjoint two cycles. So here's all 24 of the elements of S4. If we believe this theorem, it tells me that 
these elements are conjugate if and only if they have the same cycle type. The identity is the only element whose cycle type is 1. Right? 1, 1, 1, 1, if you like, in this example. It only, it's only made up of 1 cycles. Meanwhile, each of these individual transpositions, 2 cycles, has the same cycle type as one another, and so they are all conjugate to one another, but they're not conjugate to the identity element. So here, this brown shaded uh, subset here, is a conjugacy class, an equivalence class of the conjugacy relation. All the three cycles are conjugate to one another, all the four cycles are conjugate to one another, and then lastly, all of these, what I would call two plus two cycles, products of disjoint, two disjoint two cycles, these are all conjugate to one another, they have the same cycle type. So if we believe this theorem, then S4 has five conjugacy classes. And studying the conjugacy classes of a group is a really powerful way of understanding the structure of that group really intimately. Uh, because two groups that are the same are going to have the same number of conjugacy classes. And within each conjugacy class, they're going to have the same number of elements inside of that conjugacy class. Conjugacy classes are also a super powerful way to study representations of finite groups, as it turns out which is the topic that we're going to come back to one more time in our last video where we talk about Cayley's Theorem.